events organized by Public Health Foundation Bangladesh. This is Monaimul Sijar, moderator of this session. We have participants all around the world. Like for me, I'm from Netherlands and we have a lot of presenters who join this program from different countries. The virtual session will be based on environmental and occupational health. We have divided this session into two parts. In first session, we have total five participants who will present their presentation and findings. And in this session, we have two honorable distinguished session chair. Uh, we have uh, Professor M. S. Said, President, Doctors for Health and Environment. We have another session chair, Professor Tajuddin Sharkar, Chairman, Department of Public Health and Informatics, Jahanginagar University. So before starting our presentation, I would like to thanks uh, to our uh, scientific partner, ECMI, and of course the media partner, Raj Television. So we have some, we have a few uh, very good, uh, very uh, basic rules for this presentation. You know that we uh, all the presenters will get eight minutes to deliver their presentation. After six minutes, I will give a badge uh, to remind them to uh, going to finish their presentation. And I would request to maintain this time because it, it is an issue to finish all our program in time. And we have a question answer session. After finishing our five presentation, we will take our questions in our chat box from our participant, from our uh, session chairs, and from any other who would like to know more on that issue. And uh, then our honorable chairs will evaluate total uh, the presentation and make their valuable comment. So now I would like to first of all uh, request our first uh, our first presenter, uh, Ashish Paul. He is an intern physician, Dhaka National Medical Institute Hospital, Bangladesh. So may I request Ashish Paul to share his PowerPoint presentation and start. Thank you. Ashish Pal, uh, you just can share your screen. If you look, there is a option to share your screen and you can present, yeah. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear me, Ashish Pal? Even I can show your presentation. Uh, okay, I think we should go second presenter. Maybe he's facing some difficulties. No problem. Uh, so we have Abu Saleh Khan. Yeah. May I request yes. Abu Saleh Khan? Yes, I'm here. Please, you can share. Yeah. Yes, I'm right. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, yes. Hi. Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, I am thankful to the organizing committee and um, Public Health Foundation. So, uh, actually, I have a sociology background. So I was very confused initially that whether they will accept my abstract or not. And then rather later uh, when I came to know that it has been accepted. So I'm glad that it has been accepted, but I think uh, this uh, thing can make a little confusion about this thing that most of my focus has been mainly uh, 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 climate justice. So it has indirect connection with environmental and occupational health, but it has not direct connection since I don't have a concrete knowledge or uh, understanding regarding public health. So uh, this is my uh, uh, title of the paper, COVID-19 and climate change, the perplexity of the development narrative and our environmental health. So I should, uh, I think, uh, 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 clear this thing that when I use this term narrative, I meant that uh, development narrative means all our development initiative uh, like policy planning that can be government or non-government initiative regarding its implication and its practice. Okay, so uh, this is the background and rationale behind my paper. 
uh, as we can see that about 6 to 12 million people have lost their jobs in the wake of coronavirus outbreak this year so yeah you can read out this uh, point so i will i i i will rather prefer to discuss a little so that will be better so the like main background and rationale behind this was that i uh, um, i think there have been a lot of employment crisis and and uh, uh, regarding food consumption as well uh, during this pandemic and lockdown time and most of the people who have been a victim of this uh, 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 situation who were basically working class people and farmers and and uh, uh, like a garment worker or any other informal workers and you can see that uh, uh, this is i guess yeah the last point 66% of the farmers have reduced food consumption and 49% have reduced the number of meals per day and 66% have reduced consumption of fresh vegetable and fruits so yeah this is uh, uh, one of the biggest part of the background and then later you can see that um, uh, this this is a this is a news covered by uh, prothomalo where you can see that the the the, the national food uh, production has increased but then again the uh, 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 number of uh, undernourished people has increased as well so that's that is the perplexity so if we look at the uh, national gdp and our national uh, uh, news and the growth of this national economic growth so apparently it seems that we are developing and that that sort of development has been mostly focused on infrastructural development so yeah which is fine but then again the people who are basically more poor people and then working class people or a small amount of a small uh, farmer so somehow there are negative impacts on this uh, like they face this kind of negative impacts indirectly or directly at that sometime we cannot uh, 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 evaluate or or uh, oversee uh, and then uh, uh, so uh, 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 for the rational you can see that uh, i just made this point that life does not merely mean life of farmers and their crops insects snakes weeds and that we often use as vegetable uh, rodents snails and oysters everything contains the ecosystem and we need all of them so i think this has been one of the biggest perplexity that when we think about development we don't think about all this thing so adaptation and all this thing that comes to that employment creation and 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 livelihood all this thing but those all are interconnected so that we don't really i think uh, uh, concretely understand or even if we understand we cannot recognize that so this is the aim and objective of my uh, paper identifying the biggest challenges for us as a climate vulnerable nation during the global pandemic and secondly sketching the scenario of how the pandemic has managed to demonstrate the danger of climate change regarding employment local food and local food supply i think this is the main point actually my uh, paper and then the last point was inspecting the development narrative and initiative and its negative impact on biodiversity so uh, mostly i i uh, i have been supported by two basic theory and on is introduced by michel focold i think who have a sociological background uh, uh, they already know this uh, person who has been one of the prominent uh, postmodern philosopher or political theorist or you know guys so uh, biopolitics and uh, uh, biopower you know this thing so i have used this narrative here that how all of our uh, development initiative and this narrative made a situation where people they are uh, they are how to say it's like manufacture in a situation where a lot of thing that are very basic for our livelihood especially in rural areas uh, that is ignored and then secondly yeah, uh, uh, this uh, this woman she is one of the uh, most prominent uh, 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 eco feminist pioneer like theory of eco feminism and and uh, environmental activist from india vandana shiva so she has been very renowned about her position on green revolution the current form of globalization this is the theoretical underpinning of my paper and methods so uh, uh, basically i wanted to do it ethno methodological approach through it, but i couldn't manage that since of this lockdown and all this but then mostly i have done unstructured and semi structured interview with farmers garment workers and other workers employment and i have done kii as well observation was also employment as a primary uh, research method and after that an extensive review of literature was carried out which includes newspaper report magazine and journal article and uh, ngo survey 
and all that. So it's very difficult when you do a quality research to uh, uh, structure it as a K results, but still, uh, since the uh, conferences has this rule, so I just made this point because I think in a uh, ethnometrological approach or ethnography work, you really uh, can't make a result. It's rather a situation, what you describe in a way that make the clear the overall view. I think you understand that. So it was a little difficult for me, but I still I tried to make my best to make it concrete so that you can understand. So the first point was that, uh, but one thing I should, I want to remind you that all this argument, it's a very qualitative form. So if you ask me that, what is the uh, 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 real factual event? So that will be very difficult for me. I can give you so many example and evidence. That's a different thing. So the first point was the working class people who has been mostly exposed to the virus while attempting to look for alternative employment opportunities. And in urban areas, you know, like since this time, this lockdown time, I have a state in Ghazipur and Sabar, who is a morally uh, people occupied by garments workers and so many workers people. So I have stayed with them and I have seen that how, how they couldn't manage all this safety ma uh, measure and all this thing. And secondly, garments factories are becoming a migrant worker was not choice. So in most of the cases I have found this thing, I think this is one of the major issue that we couldn't still recognize that uh, uh, in garments factory and all this worker, uh, we, we, we think this is migrant worker and there are so many policies, but there are a lot of things considering my uh, 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 the climate change that made this situation and increased this uh, flow of uh, garments worker as well. So it's not their choice. At the same time, when they come into urban situation like this, there are so many vulnerabilities regarding diseases and health safety measure and even uh, uh, occupational health. You guys know better, I think, because since you have a very close connection with public health that I don't have, that is my insecurity. I'm sorry for that. I wish if I had. So, and then thirdly, farmland has been altered with overdose of chemical fertilizers and various pesticides and herbicides that have emerged along with the hybrid seeds and its industrial production. So, yeah. Um, and then eventually it resulted in greater risk of economic and health related vulnerability of rural people and structurally forced migration along with climate change. I think there will be a lot of news if you look, uh, I mean, if you search on internet, even uh, like Google it, then there are cases of people died because of herbicide and pesticide and, and all this thing. And uh, uh, so that's a prior, like uh, earlier case that, that has nothing to do with this pandemic and lockdown thing. But the main focus that I want to show that the local food supply chain has declined during the lockdown period on the one hand, poor formal and other informal workers were starving. And on the other hand, local farm produce was decomposing while is the ultimate result of our dependency on the larger market. I think this has been one of my most important points that I myself like to share with you. So yeah, so I think the my main point was during this lockdown time, even according to the report of WSO and all other thing, as a climate vulnerable nation, local food supply and our employment and livelihood, I think that has been one of the biggest challenge for us. And this pandemic and lockdown that has managed to demonstrate this vulnerability during this time. So I think this is one of uh, my uh, uh, prime concern that I tried to show throughout my paper. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's the point. And then uh, uh, there are a lot of so many problems in uh, uh, climate adaptation program as well, because then when you go there, the farmers can't afford their farming because of the fertilizer price and pesticide and all this thing. So the small farmer, they cannot afford it. So when they, where do they go? They become migrant workers, they come into urban area and they face so many problems there as well. But look at the lockdown. During the lockdown, there are so many people, they are starving, like there are no like, uh, yeah, there were news, but uh, that, that was not covered well, I think. But if you look, uh, like go to the rural area, there will be so many uh, news like that. So, so yeah, so think about this, uh, this people, it was not their choice. And, and if you think about the local uh, 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 climate situation, then I think, yeah, I think I have two more minutes. That's what you want yeah. to do. Yeah, so okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, that's the point. And yeah. So I'm all, um, uh, the industrial production based agriculture and its negative impact on a small farmers as well as consumers has been mostly ignored from the development narrative. 
yeah i think uh, the med- medical specialist i think who uh, like they will know better than me so i couldn't i i didn't go there because that was not my part so i just tried to show this government's uh, things and and how it works actually and public sentiment even i uh, this was very interesting one of the farmer who said uh, uh, i think uh, some of you may know anwar's uh, 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 delwar zahan he is the activist of prakritik he was saying that the consent was manufactured uh, he was uh, good at theory i think that's why he he was able to say that that how that farmer they have been shifted from uh, 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 rural areas to urban area at the same time they have they are facing uh, so many problems and this lockdown this showed that where we are most vulnerable that is our food supply but we really didn't recognize that still we have our lot of development policy and all that things so yeah so i am almost done here conclusion and recommendation so the first point this is uh, this is a policy response uh, addressed by fao you can see that uh, they are trying to promote that um, resilient distribution system including shorter supply chain and territorial market uh, so the second point is we need to promote a kind of agricultural production which is adaptive to climate change and has indigenous root so that everyone can afford to participate in farming and of course our rmg sector and other industries have been one of the biggest source for economic resilience of the country but we must remember our vulnerability as a result of hyper dependency of international market this one i want to uh, uh, emphasize on that hyper dependency on international market instead of focusing on poor farmer people and their adaptation system so the last point is when we plan for resilience innovation and adaptation we must recognize our history and learn from the people of this land on how they have been cultivating exchanging and supplying food in the local market that we call hat or bazaar you know like hat or bazaar so uh, in earlier time there were people who uh, like they used to exchange their product within their local uh, places but now it's more connected with central market and international market you have seen that onion prices raised high and all this problem so i think this has a lot of things to do with how we uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, recognize so many things in our development narrative and initiative as well yeah i think that's all i'm done thank you thank you uh, thank you abu salik uh, i think it was a nice presentation now i would like like to request uh, ashish pal to share his presentation and again i would request to please maintain our time because we have lot of presenters it would be better if we finish it within 8 minutes ashish pal yes sir uh, am i audible yeah you just share your screen it's okay okay, okay sir thank you mm-hmm. please go ahead can i start sure can you make it in powerpoint mode yeah now it's okay thank you Uh, respected judges and all the participants and uh, my teacher and my senior good evening uh, i am dr ashish pal an intern physician from dhaka national medical college so today i am going to present uh, a presentation which is about uh, knowledge attitude and health problem of dye worker in the selected area of old dhaka city bangladesh in our old dhaka city there are lots of dye worker due to are having various kind of health problem uh, they even don't have any awareness regarding their occupational health hazard they are living in a very poor uh, condition they are usually living in the slum area but there is a lot of gap between knowledge and attitude um, uh, in cases of handling the dye and disposal of the package uh, which mixed with the dye so uh, the main objective of the study was to find out the common health problem and their socio economic condition and their knowledge towards their occupational health hazard in the selected area of old dhaka city now the research methodology portion this was a cross sectional type of descriptive study uh, we collected data from 40 male dye worker Uh, for, from january 2019 to august 2019 and it was a convenient type of non probability sampling the data was collected and uh, it was um, analyzed by sps 20 software now the uh, result portion we can see in this uh, uh, diagram that uh, 27.50% earn 11000 to 13000 data 
and 7.5% uh, percent responded on 5,000 to 7,000 taka, and 40% on 9,000 to 11,000 taka. And 20% uh, responded are illiterate, and 55% responded having the primary education. And 92.5% uh, had the conception about the harmful effects of diet. This diagram shows that 11.11% had the thickening of the skin and the palm. These are the uh, main the dermatological problem that occurs due to poor handling of the diet. 72.22% respondent has the itching and rash and redness in the skin, and 5.56% uh, respondent has the skin disformation. And they have also some respiratory problem, like 17.5% had cough with sneezing. 50% uh, had cough and breathlessness, and 27.5% had the bronchial asthma. And 40% uh, had the hair growth problem, and uh, 30 respondent uh, uh, has, uh, has uh, some eye problem, and among them, 37.5% respondent had uh, itching with breathlessness, 12.5% had swelling of eyelid, and 5% had the vision problem and 20% had itching and redness with black image. And uh, nine, parts, uh, nine respondents uh, only use the personal protective equipment during their uh, work. And 100% uh, respondent uh, know the idea, 100% uh, respondent had the awareness regarding use of the personal protective equipment. And 25% uh, had anemia, and uh, uh, three respondents had jaundice. And uh, we have also found that 30% respondent had low blood pressure and 22.5% had high blood pressure. And we have also measured their BMI and we have found that 35% respondent uh, are overweight, 7.5% are obese and 7.5% uh, 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 are undernourished. And we have seen that 65% had headache problem and 30% um, uh, respondent usually work uh, 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 10 to 12 uh, hours per day. And we have also found that 35 uh, respondent having the habit of taking tobacco or alcohol. And 12.5% uh, uh, usually work more than one hour and 27.5% usually work more than 10 hours. That is the duration of job. And also we have found that 30% respondent uh, are having tingling sensation in the foot or hand due to the high exposure and high uh, long-term duty hour. The limitation of the study was, the study was conducted in, the simple, uh, in a single airport area of Old Dhaka city. And we have collected data from the only male worker because the female male worker are not usually involved in this job. And the owner of the dye worker uh, was not cooperative. He permitted with many restrictions due to lack of cooperation and the, uh, of the dye worker. Uh, we only collected data from the 14 respondents and there was limitation of time and financial problem. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, uh, reluctance about the health awareness, low income and lack of health education are the main causes of different health problem among the dye worker. It needs special attention from the conscious population of that area, as well as the uh, awareness among the dye work. The overall health condition uh, was not satisfactory, but their attitude towards uh, their work environment is positive. So our recommendation were on the, we have to provide them the health education, proper information regarding the personal protective equipment should be given, health awareness program should be given, and uh, there should be uh, the specification of, of time uh, of their duration of work and the government and non-government organization should work together and um, the government city corporation should uh, provide the personal creative equipment and further research should be conducted to find out the research gap and um, there should be the health center care center should be established in their locality or the slum area where they uh, live and also in their uh, workplace to uh, promote their good health and uh, the awareness among them. These are the uh, references. Thank you, judges. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ashish Pal, for your uh, nice presentation. I think it was very short and specific. Uh, so now I would like to request 
Dr. Soeda Fatima Alam, intern physician, Sohit Sohraddi Medical College, to share uh, her presentation. In the meantime, I would like to mention if you have any question, please send us in chat box so that we can address those questions after finishing the session. May I start now? Assalamu alaikum, everyone, um, honorable chairs, moderator, dear participants, I welcome you all to uh, today's uh, presentation on use of personal protective equipment among healthcare workers in Bangladesh during the initial period of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a cross-sectional study on knowledge, attitude, practice, and compliance. I'm Dr. Soda Fatima Alam working as a physician in Shwet Sorarti Medical College. So uh, when World Health Organization announced uh, COVID-19 uh, as a pandemic officially, uh, I can remember everyone panicked and being a healthcare worker, I panicked too. And uh, just like me, because uh, every physician knew that they were in the front line and they were the ones uh, who have to deal with it directly. So a total of uh, 8,000 healthcare workers, including uh, 2,800 physicians and 1,950 nurses and 3,250 supporting staff have been tested positive in Bangladesh just until September 2020. More than 5,000 people have died, including 92 physicians, according to the Bangladesh Medical Association. This is concerning in a country where there are only three physicians and one nurse for every 10,000 population. PPE plays a very vital role in infection control in healthcare facilities, uh, as we all know. There is also a, a global shortage of PPE availability, not just in our country. Well, ensuring proper and rational use of PPE is crucial for protecting healthcare workers since they are uh, repetitively exposed. Adherence and compliance of healthcare workers to recommended PPE protocols may be insufficient. Adequate knowledge about PPE, uh, personal beliefs and attitude, perception of risk, training and other educational interventions, as well as availability of PPE in the working facility can all impact their compliance. It is essential to understand the knowledge, attitude, and practice of using PPE among healthcare workers in order to inform the design and delivery of programs to improve their adherence and compliance to proper and rational use of PPE. There is especially important, this is especially important during an emergency like a pandemic, uh, which we are facing right now in a resource poor setting, like in a country we are living in, where the implementation of other measures of infection control is more challenging. Uh, the objective of our, of our study uh, was to evaluate the knowledge, attitude, uh, practice, and compliance to using PPE among healthcare workers of Bangladesh, as well as their influencing factors during the initial period of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, now, have, Let's have a look at the methods. Um, an online cross-sectional survey uh, was conducted among healthcare workers from 23rd April to 6 May, 2020, using convenient sampling. The survey instrument had three parts, demographic and working facility related information, knowledge, attitude, and practice of using PPE, self-reported compliance to PPE, and perceived barriers. Univariate and multivariate logistics regression model were used to identify the influencing factors of compliance to PPE. And the results that we found, we had uh, total respondents uh, 341. Uh, among them, uh, 
the max majority, 66.6%, were uh, from age group 21 to 30. And um, uh, very few of them, 12.9% of them were uh, above 40 years, and the rest were from 31 to 40 years age group. And uh, if we look at the uh, sex of the participants, uh, most of them were female, uh, which is 55.4%, and the rest were male. And professional uh, category uh, in which uh, state they are now in their career, most of them were early career physicians, uh, which uh, we can see here, 67.4%. And uh, other health, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, diagram, uh, the other healthcare workers like nurses and medical assistants were only 8.2%. And as our respondents, uh, as per their responses, uh, their knowledge about uh, PPE, only 37.5% uh, of them were confident that their knowledge was adequate and the rest said they did not have adequate knowledge. And um, evaluating their, their attitude towards PPE, we asked them uh, the, these questions as you can see. And the results that we uh, found, uh, if we look at the uh, last question that I feel adequately protected using PPE, only 12.3% of them agreed, which is very alarming because uh, if a healthcare worker is uh, exposing uh, himself and working uh, and dealing with the COVID-19 patients directly, and if they are, even if they are provided with PPE and they are saying only 12% of them say, are saying that they are feeling safe and the others are not, this, uh, this is very alarming. And we also asked it, if it's convenient to use the recommended PP or not, uh, only 48% uh, of them uh, agreed to that. And when it uh, came to practice of PP, 37.5% uh, of them only agreed that yes, the use was adequate and the other said no, it wasn't being used adequately. The participants were questioned about their compliance and only 16% uh, said they were compliant to the use of uh, PP and the majority, which is 84% did not have compliance, which is also, uh, I think as a healthcare worker is very alarming. And um, the predictors uh, of compliance to PP uh, on the personal level, as you can see here, were experience of treating patients in previous pandemic, training on proper use of PPE, adequate knowledge about PPE, using adequate PPE during regular patient care, and uh, related to workplace where proper donning and doffing facility available in the hospital. And as per our respondents, the barriers uh, that we identified uh, to PPE compliance is as follows, is shortage of supply, doubtful quality of the PPE, inconvenience of using recommended PPE, lack of appropriate donning and doffing facility. So they suggested that appropriate training and adequate supply of PPE would facilitate their compliance. Um, if I quote one of our participants comment, uh, which was, uh, I'm, I am using PP and I don't know if it has any grade at all. I am reusing gown and a surgical mask and goggles, which are indeed a biker goggle and a single pair of gloves due to shortage. How can I feel safe? Again, my coworkers like ward boy nurses have never heard about the phrase donning and doffing. So basically I'm exposed to COVID-19 regarding disposal of my gloves and mask I'm sure they will just throw them away. And I bring my gown back home to disinfect. Am I safe or should I feel safe? Uh, this is exactly how most of the healthcare workers felt in the early or initial days of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the limitation of our study that uh, uh, we uh, say is uh, it was a web-based survey, so which might generate sampling bias and thus limit the 
generalizability of the findings. We used a subjective tool to evaluate the knowledge and practice of using PPE, self-reported confidence of efficiency of donning and doffing, as well as the compliance to PPE may be impacted by social desirability bias of the respondents. Moreover, the small sample size, specifically the small number of healthcare workers other than physicians may not be representative of all healthcare workers. In conclusion, um, the level of knowledge and practice as well as self-reported compliance of using PPE against SARS-CoV-2 was not satisfactory during the initial phase of the pandemic among the healthcare workers of Bangladesh. Shortage of supply, poor quality, and unavailability of appropriate donning and doffing facilities were reported as the major barriers to required compliance. An emergency and adequate stockpile of PPE along with appropriate trading series of the healthcare workers on the rational use of PPE is highly recommended. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Seth Fatima Alam, for uh, your excellent presentation. I'm sure you will get some uh, good reflection of your presentation. Thank so you, may sir. I request someone of the Raj television that our uh, another presenter, Fazle Faruqi from USA could not join due to technical problem. Uh, could you uh, look over the issue? It would be great. Uh, so now I would like to request Nasrin Akhtar, lecturer one, Department of Public Health, Northern University to deliver his presentation. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Just you need to share your presentation. Honorable chairs, respected moderator, participants, and audience, assalamu alaikum. Please receive my uh, heartfelt gratitude. Uh, I'm Dr. Nasrin Akhtar, lecturer, Department of Public Health, Northern University, Bangladesh. I'm really uh, excited and delighted uh, to be here. My topic is, uh, study topic is compliance on wash facilities among the clients of community clinics uh, of Bangladesh, a comparative study. So let's proceed to the background of the study. <clears throat> All of we know that uh, a significant amount of death around the world occurring by infectious diseases like uh, diarrhea or uh, other waterborne diseases and mostly affected groups are children under five. So let's see um, uh, the statistics of some studies like about 62 under five children per 1000 uh, die of diarrhea each year. 8.5% of the total death in Bangladesh is caused by communicable diseases from water, sanitation, and hygiene related issues. And the burden of healthcare associated infection in developing countries is high. So, uh, from that point of view, a study conducted on uh, all the uh, community clinics in Bangladesh uh, uh, to see the uh, existing status of the water sanitation and hygiene facilities. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, uh, say something about community clinics. All of we know that uh, to make the primary healthcare services much available, even near to the doorstep, uh, doorstep our government built up nearly 14,000 community clinics throughout the country. So it is an amazing initiative to serve the people held at the community level. Uh, so let's back to the study that I have mentioned uh, earlier. So we can see the uh, uh, statistics of the uh, study that the, uh, they studied um, uh, through on uh, 13,394 community clinics and they found uh, one third of uh, the community clinics had functional water sources and non-functional toilet, but only 16% had two functional latrines. So this, uh, this status can result a great burden of communicable diseases from primary healthcare facilities. Uh, so why we decided to conduct this study? 
Here, uh, as you can see, uh, two categories, uh, see the picture of two categories of CCs here. One category is community clinic, wash renovated, water sanitation, hygiene renovated community clinics done by WaterAid Bangladesh. And another picture on the right side, we can see here the wash non renovated community clinics. And uh, we are seeing that uh, the wash facilities in the renovated uh, community clinics are really satisfactory. and. On the other hand, in the, uh, the situation of the non renovated uh, community clinics is really depressive. That is why we decided to conduct this study uh, aimed to assess the comparative situation and the compliance related to WASH, WASH facilities in two categories of community clinics of Mehirpur and Kushia districts in Bangladesh. More specifically, to compare the existing situation regarding WASH in two types of community clinics, to compare the level of compliance by the clients, to assess the advice provided by the healthcare providers regarding WASH, to compare the associated factors accounted for the compliance with the existing WASH facilities. The study was a comparative type of cross-sectional study with mixed method approach. It took three months and you can see here the map of the uh, geographical map of two study places. Uh, uh, we choose uh, adjacent two areas to make a better comparison as their uh, uh, demographical culture and demographic are the same. And uh, we choose 20 sample for the uh, qualitative approach and 400 sample, uh, uh, respondents for the quantitative uh, approach. And we uh, took uh, support from the Rouse of sample size calculator to uh, calculate the total sample size. And our respondents were the clients who received services from the county clinics and uh, aged between 18 to 64 years old. Uh, to collect the data, we used pre uh, both for the both approaches. We used pre-tested semi-structured questionnaire, and to collect the qualitative data, uh, we collected the qualitative data through key informant interview, and the quantitative data through face-to-face -face interview. And we used some indicators here, like socio-demographic information, existing wash facilities advice provided by um, community healthcare providers on wash to clients. Sorry for interruption, you have two minutes. Yeah, so please go first. Compliance to wash facilities by the clients and CACPs as well as reasons for non-compliance. We analyze the uh, collected data through SPSS uh, version 21 software and um, we did uh, frequency percentage for the descript descriptive components and independent test to make the comparison and also go through the logistic res uh, regression for to identify the predictors. So let's have a look on the result. Uh, on the section A, uh, the study found that uh, the most maximum renovated community clinics had uh, available safe drinking water source, available improved toilet, and also hand washing stations. But on the other hand, the uh, non-renovated CCs had only one third had the uh, available water source and less than half uh, had the um, uh, improved toilet and uh, only 4% had the uh, hand washing stations. And the section B, we uh, study find that, found that uh, a significant comparison on uh, compliance of wash facilities in two different of community uh, clinics among the clients that we found that the uh, compliance uh, of the wash facilities in renovated community clinics is much higher rather than the non renovated community clinics. And uh, then in the section C, we found that all the healthcare providers gave uh, uh, advices so that their clients to use wash facilities. And at the uh, section D, we found some uh, uh, indicators like um, married respondents over uh, more than uh, 40 years of uh, old, they didn't use the uh, safe drinking water on the uh, community clinics and also respondents had no formal education, they didn't use toilet and hand washing stations. 
and uh, results from the qualitative approach supports our quantitative uh, um, uh, approach results and that uh, a very depressive scenario we can see that 20 or 10 percent uh, non renal diseases had the worst facilities and also uh, i quoted here the um, uh, as um, as speech of uh, a, a community healthcare provider of Anjun, uh, Anjun Gachi Community Clinic, that is non renovated Community Clinic. He said that there was no uh, uh, suitable drinking uh, water there, and there was uh, no functioning toilet. And if they needed, uh, they need to go uh, the toilet at home uh, nearby. And uh, in a nutshell, I want to uh, uh, summarize the result. The, this study revealed measurable scenario of existing wash facilities in non renovated community clinics. Study found two times better compliance on use of wash facilities among the clients of renovated community clinics rather than the non renovated county clinics, while non educated respondents found as more reluctant to comply the facilities. There are some few, uh, few recommendations, recommendations to have. Uh, we want to suggest actually number one is uh, sustainable and comprehensive programs need to be conducted to strengthen the existing water sanitation and hygiene facilities and its uh, maintenance at the community clinics. Knowledge of the community people um, on wash practice might be improved through effective and demonstrative health education session to make them aware. And uh, even uh, in every community clinic, the uh, dedicated uh, human resources should be assigned for the proper maintenance of wash facilities. As we found, non educated persons more reluctant to comply, so pictorial and attractive guidelines can be pasted on the premises of wash facilities. I hope these initiatives can improve our county clinics and might be more supportive to mitigate the communicable diseases and uh, can improve the health well being of the community, community people as well. These are some references we used. And thank you everyone for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Nastim Nakhtar, for your uh, nice presentation. Now we have last presenter, Fazde Faruqi from USA. Can you hear me, Fazde Faruqi? Have you yes, solved I can your hear technical? you. Thank you. Yeah, so you can share your presentation and just proceed. Can you see my presentation? Yes, just make it in presentation mode. It will be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be presenting this uh, topic, how to estimate the outdoor abundance of harmful airborne fungal spores, uh, because it could be related with the current situation. COVID patients which uh, have underlying diseases due to these allergens, have a worse outcome. And the condition of Bangladesh is very much favorable for this kind of fungal spores. Uh, this was a funded project and we had a pretty large uh, team uh, from my university, University of Mississippi Medical Center. I was the PI, Dr. Galen Marshall, uh, who is our chief allergist and also has a PhD in immunology, was uh, very critical person for this project. We also had a lot of others. Uh, we had partners from NASA. And uh, just to mention that David Larry, he's the one who did the machine learning algorithm for this project. So time is the issue. So I have no time to mention who did what part. Let's go to the next slide. So exposure to these harmful airborne fungal spores, which we're calling as halves, can cause a wide range of health problems from very mild to very severe. And herbs induced immune reaction, which is known as immunoglobular IgE, can be severe to vulnerable people. And fungal spores are abundant as airborne biorosols, both in indoor environment and outdoor environment. While the indoor fungal spores are highly dependent on the indoor conditions uh, and good maintenance can uh, um, stop their growth. The outdoor abundance depends on the outdoor environment, both at local scale and regional scale. So in one region, one uh, district, for example, may have a different environment than the another district, but also it could be different from 
very local at a neighborhood scale. Actual monitoring of mold spores is very expensive. So there are very limited number of monitoring stations. So researchers attempted to estimate using environmental variables which favor the growth of these fungal spores, but without much success. Just as a recap, molds are tiny fungi whose spores float through the air. They like damp environments and need four things to grow. The right kind of food, air, appropriate temperature, and water. All these conditions are very favorable in Bangladesh. And molds can be found in outdoor environment, also in homes and other buildings, such as in schools and even in some hospitals and clinics as well. So current status of this estimation is based on very, very, very limited number of uh, monitoring stations. As you see on the left, there are these red uh, dots. Those are the uh, fungal spore monitoring stations. There is only one in Louisiana and in Texas, there is only one and there is another one in uh, Oklahoma for the Southeast region. But there is not a single one in Mississippi or concerned Tennessee or West Virginia. However, you can see this kind of maps based on that limited number of monitoring stations, which are not much useful. However, if you know about the outdoor mold spore abundance, you can limit your outdoor exposure. Even physicians can uh, adjust your dose based on your possible exposures. But with this condition is not much useful. It's interesting, my project manager from NASA, uh, he's one of those people who are very sensitive to these allergens. He likes outdoor environment, uh, particularly water skiing. So based on this information, often he went out but became sick. So he was rather interested in our project and visited uh, to see our progress more frequently than he did for other projects. And here are the uh, measures. They are saying low, moderate, high, and very high based on the total count. These counts are in volume of the year. And that means if it is less than 5,000 per cubic meter of air, then it is low. So if it is more than 50,000 per cubic meter of air, then it is very high. As I mentioned, uh, mentioned before, that attempts have been made to estimate, but without much success. So our objective was to estimate these ambient halves so that it can be used at community level. We wanted to estimate accurate enough so that people at least can use at community level and make informed decision and the physicians can use this information as well. We wanted to estimate specific type of mold support, not just the total count. And in addition to the total count, we developed two other measures called the spike and burst, and I will define those later on. We wanted to explore the usefulness of satellite data and model parameters. And we also wanted to explore multiple modeling methods, including machine learning. These are the four types. These are the five spore types, Cladiosporium, Alternaria, Cacibotris, Aspergillus, and Penicillium. And um, American uh, Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, they have identified seven spore types as clinically significant. And these are five of those seven. And you can read all of those are related with our health issues. Tachybatteries is rather rare, but one of the most dangerous one. But in our study area, we found plenty of those as well. So these are the list of the data that we have used in this study. The top one, these are the data from NASA satellite, which include uh, moisture index, which include vegetation index, land surface temperature, aerosol optical depth, and precipitation from different kinds of satellite data. Good thing is that 
all of these data are publicly available. So someone from Bangladesh, they want to do any such study, they can access to those. And we also used a set of model parameters from NOAA. All of these are also publicly available. So again, people can access and use those. In addition to that, we collected primary data from the ground, which includes the precipitation, rainfall, air temperature, relative humidity, soil moisture, leaf wetness, wind, direction, and speed. This is the typical setup of uh, the picture you see of those monitoring devices. And on your left, you can see the six selected sites in uh, central Mississippi area. Mississippi, I should have had a map here, which is a little bit smaller than Bangladesh, but population is very low, only 2.9 million, as opposed to uh, the huge population in Bangladesh. So we had some rural and urban area settings. This is one of the rural areas where you see that we had no power connection. That's why we had to use the solar panel and also battery. And uh, this weird looking thing, that's the trap where we can collect more for samples. On top of that, there's a data logger and also uh, uh, wind direction and speed collecting devices. Finally, we had to collect mold spore samples, which was trapped in this uh, device. So with these four defined kind of data sets, we attempted to do our modeling. The next slide, I will show how those uh, trap looks like. This is the famous barcode uh, mold spore and also pollen traps. The only one company who developed it many, many years back, and that's still the standard, and uh, we had to purchase it uh, from London and they shipped it from here. That's the left one uh, picture you see. That's the one looks like from outside. If you pull this handle. Uh, excuse me, like Mr. Fosde Faruqi. I hope you are considering your time as well. Thank you. What's how much time I have left? Two minutes, but you okay. can get three minutes. Yeah, no problem. Okay, all righty. Well, uh, after you count that, and this is the slit where it uh, sucks in air along with those samples. And we need to convert it into the number per cubic air, uh, per cubic meter of the air. And these are the, some of the photographs we have taken. This is the Alternaria, this is Clasporium, this is Stachybotris, this is our lab, this is Dr. Uh, Bracken. She is looking at those and you can see those in the monitor. She's taking picture and she's also training one of our PhD students. Uh, the result, you can see that from monitoring station to station, this is during the cold season, this is in warm season, it varies. Interestingly, as you see, these are the two types, Cladiosporium and Alternaria. In, in uh, December, January and February, is declining cladiosporium. On the contrary, alternaria, it is more abundant. So not all spore types are the same. And each one has a different implication in terms of health. More importantly, as you see, as opposed to the national measures, the NAB National uh, Allergy Bureau, the median value was 6,500. Our median value was 54,000, much higher. And in the same way, if you can look at the others, and other characteristics, even within the same day, they vary so much. If there's a little rain during the time, it will go down, then soon after the rain, it will go crazy. So people need to know the behavior. Actually, people do not need, the scientists know the behavior and they, can, they should model it accordingly. And we created this sort of maps, which is 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer resolution. And, uh, the key results include, because of the complex biological behaviors of mold spores, we explored multiple approaches, which include linear regression, multiple regression, logistic regression, and finally, machine learning. Machine learning showed the uh, most promise, and among the, from about uh, 88 variables, we found PM2.5, that's a particulate matter, latent heat flux, evaporation from land and transpiration, are the most important variables. Uh, 
just to make a note that in Bangladesh situation may be different. So if we do this sort of modeling in Bangladesh, we need to uh, do that with the local data because one of the resources in Bangladesh could be all those urban drainage where these guys are growing like crazy. But this is the last slide. Spore type abundance varies depending on their individual characteristics. Better results in estimation comes from non-linear non models, which machine learning can uh, accommodate because nature is basically non-linear. Use data related to the estimation modeling are publicly available. I'm emphasizing on this one because our students uh, in, in rare cities in Bangladesh, they are very much capable of conducting those kind of advanced computation with uh, uh, minimum guidance. And having suitable conditions for mold sports in Bangladesh related health burdens are expected to be very high. Uh, my friends who are uh, respiratory physicians, particularly in my hometown, Rajshahi, and uh, they see huge number of patients seasonally, the number goes up and down, mostly related to this sort of allergens. Young researchers should be encouraged in multidisciplinary collaboration to develop useful models to estimate such mold spores and prevention is better than cure. So we should try to eliminate the condition which favors grow this sort of mold spores. Uh, just last note that we do have all those devices now. I have nine of those mold spore traps and I will welcome any collaboration. I can let them borrow my devices as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fosde Faruqi. It was nice presentation and I think it was a different as well. So now floor is open for everyone. If you have any question to our uh, presenters, uh, it's time to ask. So we will wait for 10 to 15 seconds. If you have any question, you can ask or you can uh, send out the um, um, message in chat box. Uh, do you have any question or, or it's crystal clear, clear from our presenters? I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so as we don't have any uh, question, so I think now it's time to listen some valuable words uh, from our distinguished uh, session chairs. I would like to uh, give the floor, uh, Professor M. S. Said, President, Doctors for Health and Environment, and I would request to give him a short speech. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to chair the session. There, as there is no question, I have got many questions to many of them, many of the speakers. But now I think the, the presenters, they presented very nicely. Uh, and the, their research work, though in the COVID situation, lockdown situation, they have collected the data, um, they have presented all these things with their scientific uh, evaluation. Now, let me tell the Saleh Khan, the Saleh Khan, who is the first presenter, uh, he related climatic change with the vulnerability of the people. I think that was also a nice presentation. Yes, there is a vulnerability, there is a starvation, there is a uh, lacking of job, opportunity, income, limited. So that's presentation that is that is a very good presentation for uh, from Salek Khan <clears throat> now the ashish pal ashish pal the dark side of the dye industry that has been explored by dr ashish it was a very nice presentation that he interviewed and then he com the, the complications the occupational hazards is rightly pointed out that is the skin complications and there is a respiratory complications, there is a eye complications, and also there is a uh, there is a situations the industrial workers are living. So that is also a nice presentation for Ashish Paul. And for them, Fatima, Fatima Alam, Sayyida Fatima Alam, Dr. Sayyida Fatima, uh, she presented the knowledge at a practice and compliance. So it is very uh, regarding the PPE, personal protection equipments. The, our the knowledge 
about this, the health workers, there's very poor knowledge. Uh, she uh, presented this data and early careers there, there was it not only uh, uh, the limitations are also very, they spoke nicely. Now, uh, the Nasrin Akhtar, Dr. Nasrin Akhtar, he complains of wash facilities and the, uh, she compared the study from renovated and non-renovated. She also analyzed the data, the educated, non-educated, and occupational factors they have in, she has introduced this. And lastly, Fazlur uh, Faruqi. Fazlur Faruqi, I, 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 nice to see you, that is what you are doing. That is a very sophisticated job. Now, my question is to you that how many of the people in United States and globally, it is a disease, it is a health problem. In this period, as a COVID situation, and also in all other periods, what are the United States population, morbidity and mortality? Can you quote that? Do I have any figure? There are how many morbidity of the people suffer from, 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 from this uh, uh, spore, the, 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 the fungal spore, the outdoor about setting and indoor setting? And about what is the ten percent of population are uh, sensitive to this sort of allergens globally. Uh, and is, in terms of this COVID context, I see in the state where I'm living, this is in Mississippi. This is one of the underlying causes of uh, severity from COVID. What is the mortality? What is the mortality of this uh, uh, spore affected population? As he said, that it depends on the uh, individual system. A yes, individual. So about ten percent of the population, global population, are they are sensitive to this sort sensitive. of allergen. Yes, they are sensitive. But again, it may be a spore. It may be some other pollen grain too. And what is the defense mechanism just exerted by a body, host immunity to this spore and other pollen grain? Is there any path pathogenic mechanism that is differs? Yes, yes, they, these are different. Even even the spore alternaria works in a different way than uh, stachybatteries. Some are uh, directly toxic, some are not. So they have a different mechanism, each one. So you are a physician, you, you probably know that. That's why they do the allergy test and uh, identify the remedy. Okay, thank you. Now it is the Dr. Tajuddin Shikdar. Would you please say something before conclusion of the session? Sir, thank you so much. It's a very a good opportunity for me to work with you in the same platform. Like, I, mean, uh, I guess it's for the first time, right? Hmm? Sir, Professor Nisahid, sir, right? It's for the first time. Okay. Yeah, we are in the same platform to uh, evaluate or to uh, hear the presentation from of uh, occupational and environmental health. Okay, I actually, I was uh, basically, I was in a different world uh, while I was uh, listening the presentation. I mean, diversified presentations, you know, from, the, from our five presenters, right? And I totally agreed with you, uh, Professor M. Said, sir. Your observations are okay, but I have uh, a little uh, curiosity uh, regarding few presentations and some suggestion as well. Uh, for, uh, first of all, Abu Saleh Khan. Actually, when I uh, just um, uh, came to know uh, his research title, COVID-19 in, in connection with climate change, I was mm -hmm. amazed. Yeah, because, because these sort of different types of research. Yeah because someone for the first time, because I'm, I'm working in a public health sector, someone for the first time in my knowledge in Bangladesh, working with COVID-19 in connection with climate change, right? And uh, some of his uh, background is really good. And uh, it was uh, thing provoking as well, because we know uh, that there is a perplexity you know, between environment and development, but here, uh, for the first time, I came to know from Mr. Abu Saleh Khan that there is a perplexity, of course, is existing uh, between food production and malnutrition, right? Food production is increasing in Bangladesh in this COVID situation, but at the same time, you are saying that malnutrition is also increasing. It's of course, uh, uh, how it's a paradox, I think. 
right? It's very interesting. And, and of course, livelihoods and occupational um, uh, health uh, are compromising in this COVID-19 situation. Many people are losing their job in Bangladesh and they are having some trouble and difficulties in, in their uh, family life, social life, of course. But one thing I'm missing from your presentation, that is climate change. Uh, the title is climate change, but the main components of climate I mean, the temperature, humidity, and some other sort of factors are actually uh, absent in your uh, research. So I, I guess that your research is not yet finished, right? You are in the middle of your research or something like yeah, this. And yes. of course, it's a qualitative research, right? Yeah. I do appreciate. So after, uh, after him, uh, Mr. Ashish Paul, knowledge, attitude, and health problems of dye workers as our professor uh, said that is the that there is a dark side hmm, of these dye industries that these sort of pollutions are releasing into our environment and the workers are exposed over there, right? And um, at, basically, it's a very uh, surprising thing, you know. I I do strongly agree with your research outputs that every one of your research, I mean, most of the participants. Uh, of your research, uh, of your study, they actually well aware about the, how to say, um, about the danger of the pollutions they are exposing, uh, they exposed in the dye industry. And I think the industry owners, the policymakers, everybody, everybody know about those dangers, but nobody actually care. Nobody actually given a huge thing or incentives in this regard, in this in, uh, or intervention in this in this sector, so that the um, you know all over the Bangladesh, uh, all over the world, there is a um, a common phrase that the labor cost in Bangladesh is very cheap. Of course, it's cheap, but in contrast or in return, the workers at least have the how to say rights. You know, rights to uh, uh, to have a safe occupational environment, right? But we are not ensuring these things. And one thing uh, you didn't mention in your research because the uh, study you have done uh, that needs ethical permission on certificate. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't know exactly uh, that uh, you have any ethical permissions from any uh, uh, authorized body or not, right? And another thing is missing um, for the attitudinal study, knowledge or attitude study, uh, you need to go or you need to follow some scale, some parameters, and you have to validate, validated those parameters. But uh, yeah. I didn't see any sort of things in your research. Okay. So after him, uh, Soeda Fatima Alom, uh, very important research regarding the PPE. Hmm? Uh, among the health workers, I mean the knowledge attitude uh, on the PPE, and it was a, <laughs> I have to say, yeah, at the beginning of the COVID-19 situations, we, uh, I think, more than 80 percent of the people of Bangladesh, they came to know for the first time the world word PPE, right? Uh, there was scarcity, there was wrong perception regarding this PPE. Uh, we came to uh, we we saw in the television and electronic media and printing media that the bank workers they wearing the PPE and they are doing offices right and in contrast the physicians nurses they are not getting the PPE you know, for their work so that was a very how to say funny time and uh, um, uh, and we all uh, experienced this time and uh, PPE. And at, at the same time, you, you use uh, one term, doffing and donning, right? So <laughs> these two words, uh, because it's very new, new, new concepts, new things hmm, uh, for the people of Bangladesh, for the physicians of Bangladesh, right? Even the people don't know how to wear the mask, how to wear the gloves, right? How to dispose them hmm, correctly, right? So how they came to know doffing and donning so your research is really good i i do appreciate and after that nasrin after you work on wash among the clients in community clinics 
I do appreciate, but I'm 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 a little bit surprised about to uh, to see the some statistics, some information you have shown in your background that is 62 out of 1,000 people, mm, uh, 1,000 people die in Bangladesh due to diarrhea. I don't know this reference is the maybe a uh, very old one. Uh, uh, in which year you collected this uh, information? Because Bangladesh actually uh, advanced so fast, uh, and this sort of diarrheal disease, cholera disease, uh, actually Bangladesh um, um, achieved a lot in in this uh, mortality sector of of diarrhea, right? And you mentioned eight point five percent are dying due to communicable disease. I do agree with that. The um, uh, figure is something like this. And, you know, it's not a big surprise, uh, Ms. Nastunakar, that renovated versus, versus non-renovated uh, uh, performance in the community clinics. The renovated clinics must uh, have the, how to say, good hygiene and sanitation facilities, of course, right? And you, all, uh, you also showed uh, this sort of research in your, uh, this sort of outputs from your research, right? And, uh, but one thing I need to know from you, do you have any idea, do you have any recommendation that after how many years this community clinics should go for the renovations, right? What is the lifetime of, uh, of the renovation should take place? For example, two years, five years, uh, what is your recommendation? So this recommendation is very important. Uh, I think in this regard, and I do appreciate your recommendations as well. Uh, and after you, uh, Dr. Faz Fazli Faruqi, it's really, really amazing because after four presentations, uh, I mean, very identical presentations, I just experienced a very technical one from you, uh, and which include the machine learnings, right? Okay. And uh, I, I just tried to connect your research with the Bangladesh perspectives, you know, in the post-autumn um, season in Bangladesh. I mean, uh, uh, like uh, in November and October and November, Bangladesh also uh, suffered a lot uh, due to this, um, uh, how to say, scuffs, right? Uh, flu uh, um, harmful airborne fungal spores, yeah. uh, hubs. Hmm. Uh, because you know, in our in, in our residential area, every sort of furniture, hmm, electronics, everything, hmm, even in our computer as well, we we we, uh, we used to see this sort of fungal spores. Hmm. And um, I don't know its uh, pathogenicity. Hmm. And uh, uh, Professor Said asked you about the mortality in America. Uh, actually, we don't have any statistics in Bangladesh as well, right? And I do appreciate, and you have shown that uh, from the uh, machine learning, um, uh, how to say, it, analysis, better results will, you will find from the non-linear models. Of course, I do, I, I do uh, strongly hope that you will go further with your research and you will have a very good publications and you will successfully uh, finished your pro project as well. So that's all from my end, Professor uh, MSI, sir. Uh, actually, I enjoyed a lot this sort of presentation and Mr. Caesar, I'm thanking you and um, I heard you say the Public Health Foundation Bangladesh to invite me. Dr. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one, one second. Uh, my intention uh, to present this one, hmm. that uh, young researchers in Bangladesh will pursue this sort of research and they can get uh, help from the senior folks, including me, I'll be glad to work with them. Thanks. That looks very nice. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank so you. let us conclude. Before I concluding this session, uh, just I tell you that when you say that the environment, the environment is a big subject. It encompasses the micro environment, macro environment, natural mm -hmm. environment, social environment, individual environment, family environment. So it encompasses so many things. The occupation hazard, is, I think this, uh, this theme is taken, is very appreciated. That's true. Okay. Uh, I think due to internet uh, disruption, uh, we lost uh, Professor MSI, sir. Okay, so thank you very much.
our panelists, our participants, our attendees, and of course, our session chair. Now, I would like to uh, conclude this session, and uh, I would like to go the next session. I hope our all presenters are ready. So in this session, uh, we have two distinguished chairs, Professor Mahabuba Nasim, Director, Institute of Disaster Management and Vulnerability Studies, University of Dhaka, University of Dhaka. And we have another uh, chair, Professor M. H. Faruqi, Associate Professor, Department of Occupational and Environmental Health, Bangladesh University of Health Science. So now uh, I would like to request our other presenters. First of all, I would like to request uh, Abu Said, Department of Post Harvest Technology and Marketing, Potuakhali University of Science and Technology, Bangladesh. I would like to request Mr. Abu Said to share your presentation and deliver your presentation within eight minutes. Thank you. Mr. Sidhar, I would like to say bye. Huh? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice session. Yeah. Welcome, madam and sir. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, please, uh, Abu Said. Uh, um, yeah. Just you need to uh, use your PowerPoint mode. Then it will be zoom out. Yeah. Okay, you can start. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my study. I am outside on behalf of my team. I will present our study. The title of my study was Rest of Water while scrubbing hand with soap during hand washing. A concern emitted the COVID 19 pandemic in Bangladesh. Hand washing. Uh, any hand problem? Washing, yeah. uh, hand washing is hand washing is often considered as a, as a synonym, uh, synonym of hand washing. Hand hygiene is an important public health media and it has been recognized to be convenient, effective, and also possible. During the COVID-19 pandemic, most effective media to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Uh, hello, any problem? Please go ahead. It's okay. Okay. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, frequent hand washing with soap and uh, water was considered as one of the most effective media to reduce the spread of infection. Who and uh, units also recommend us to wash our hands with soap. Uh, and describing five to thirty seconds to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, evidence suggests that the frequency of hand washing has to also important been increased during the kind of COVID-19 pandemic. However, we hypothesize that water loss could happen due to an open tap while hand is scrubbing with soap. Uh, Abu Said, I think we cannot see your screen. Can you again share? Please. Yeah, now it's okay. It's okay. Please go ahead. Now it's okay. okay. Uh, the aim of the of the aim of the of our study was uh, to determine the water loss during hand study with soap while the tap is on during the COVID nineteen pandemic in Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, for the study, we did a web based cross sectional survey. Uh, to know the hand wash uh, practice of general public of Bangladesh. Some of sampling method was used to recruit the participants. Total uh, 1,980 participants uh, completed the questionnaire. We collected data on social data. We said that uh, survey uh, included question on the frequency of hand washing, duration of lettering hand with soap, duration of scrubbing hand, and whether they keep their house at home or off. During the lettering and scrubbing time. Uh, besides the cross sectional study, we did an experiment uh, to, uh, uh, to estimate the amount of water waste during that time of 
decide that we can um, use sensor tap or automatically tap. Furthermore, the other the other thing we're gonna need to make people ever in Bangladesh to shut out the faucet at period when water is not being used, considering the limited water resources uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Abu Said, for your presentation. Now I would like to request our second presenter of this session, Joita Dotto, PhD candidate. University of Toledo, USA. Abu Said, please uh, share, stop your sharing. Yeah. Joita Dotto, can you hear me? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, Joita Dotto, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now it's okay. okay. Please share your presentation. Yeah. Can you see the presentation? Yes, please. I think it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, thank you everyone for being here for the session. And it's a privilege for me to have the opportunity to present my story here. Uh, yeah, I didn't say it as a study, I just said it's a story because. Uh, I believe every research is a story. Every researcher tells a story. Uh, the story might be of a virus. It might be of a um, molecule. It might be of numbers. It might be of uh, historical figures. But uh, you know, we the uh, public health researchers are the most fortunate ones because we have the opportunity to tell the story of people. So today I'm going to tell the story of female ready-made garments workers of Bangladesh um, and I'm going to talk about depression as an issue they are facing in their workplace. So uh, my slides will be having information you can see and you can read. So I'm not going to uh, going in details reading the slides, but what I'm going to do is I, just as I said, I'm going to tell you the story. So we all, all of us know that uh, the ready-made garments sector is the highest contributor to the growing GDP of Bangladesh. And women are the main workforce of this industry. We all know that. But what is the magnitude of that? Can you imagine more than 80% of the workforce engaged in ready-made garments industry are women? So in other words, we can say that women are the working force, driving force of the growing economy of Bangladesh. So uh, another thing from various studies, we can we found that uh, depression and anxiety, this kind of mental health issues are more um, prevalent in the workers engaged in ready-made garments, uh, uh, ready-made garments industry in comparison to other industries. Also, why uh, mental health is important when it is present with some other chronic condition it reduces the life expectancy by 20 percent and when it is present alone it reduces the life ex expectancy of people by uh, sorry 20 years and 10 years so uh, moreover in the scenario of bangladesh the cultural and socio-cultural environment women are reluctant to seek medical care for uh, themselves let it be a physical health or mental health. So I tried to find the magnitude of this problem in the ready-made garments. So I looked at the prevalence and the associated uh, factors of depression in those garments. I did a cross-sectional study uh, in nine ready-made garments, uh, which are situated at Naranganj, uh, Sripur, Gajipur, and Dhaka. 
and the study was done in 2015 to 20 between 2015 and 2016. Uh, as I said, the study population was ready, female ready-made garments workers, and we included those who have more than 10 years of ex uh, working experience in any ready-made garments industry. We excluded the women who were pregnant or who had uh, been engaged in some other kind of works like cleaning or like office works in the ready-made garments industry. The sample size we found to be, by calculating, taking 50% prevalence, we found 384, but uh, by sampling technique and having the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we were able to uh, have 186 respondents. Uh, I used the PHQ-9, which is Patient uh, Health Questionnaire Tool, which is a validated nine item tool, and it, uh, we use the translated version of this, and that version is also validated. And just to let you know, the scoring is done in a scale of 27 in this uh, tool. And the data analysis was done in SPSS. Uh, the prevalence was found to be 27.4% among the respondent. 51 out of 186 respondents told uh, scored more than four, which, which uh, indicates some form of depression. Now, the, among those who were depressive, uh, the severe depression was 5.4%, moderately severe was 1.6%, 7.5% had moderate uh, depression, and 12.9% uh, had mild depression. So this number gives us a picture that says, yes, there is depression among the ready-made garments workers. Now, what are the associate associated factors with uh, this problem. Uh, we found significant association between ca uh, categorized age of the respondents, presence of another earning member in the family. This was negatively associated. And then depression status and uh, difficulties faced in daily life. This was positively associated and having hypertension, which was also positively associated. Now, what do we as public health worker recommend. The very first thing is recognition of the occupational health and occupational safety as a priority in this industry. The employers, the policymakers, the government, everyone should uh, take it seriously and should draw the attention of foreign trading partners as this is an uh, export oriented industry. So they can uh, enforce the industrialists and policymakers to improve the labor standard and uh, the working condition, working environment in the uh, factories. To conclude, I would like to say this study provides evidence that there is prevalent depression in this industry among the women. So for the betterment of the country, for the betterment of the economy of the country, we should look at that. But under the ongoing pandemic situation, this has a relevance. As per the World Bank blogs, we saw the US retail sales fail 8.7% in March 2020 due to COVID-19. As a result, what happened? The demand of ready-made garments from, out, uh, from uh, around the world, also Europe also, uh, that has been declined, the orders being canceled. And as a result, these RNG workers lost their job. And what happened? They had to struggle for survival. They were uh, pushed into severe financial hardship. As a result, this could easily lead to mental health issues like depression, anxiety, stress. So finding of that study, this uh, if we look at this study in the light of the ongoing pandemic, it implies the requirement of policy adaptation and initiatives to ensure the mental well-being of the RMG workers, and which cannot be done by one authority. It should be a collective approach, collective action taken by the government, the international organizations, the global buyers, and local factories. All of them, if work together, then they can deal with the impacts of this pandemic to this industry, which is the driving force of the uh, economy of Bangladesh. I would like to acknowledge my supervisor. This was my uh, MPH thesis study. This is a part of that. So uh, my supervisors, Dr. Williams and Dr. Taufik Mahajwardhan and uh, Dr. Malubika Sharkar, she guided me a lot during that time. Uh, 
Um, it was a teamwork uh, under the summative learning project. So I, I would like to thank my uh, team members. And this study was funded by HLO, uh, ILO. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, any suggestions, or any feedback, you are welcome. Yeah, thank you, Joita Dotto. So we have a different question and answer session. And mm -hmm. thank you very much for your storytelling. And <laughs> we know uh, your co-storyteller, Dr. Tofik Jawadar and Ilyas Mahmoud, because they are very prominent in our public health professional uh, arena in Bangladesh. And yeah. they are also my teacher too, because I am okay. the same school, James P. Grant of School of Public Health from 10 batch. So nice okay. to meet with you. Oh, now I am from Okay, sure. Thank you. So now uh, I would like to request uh, Shoykot Shah to listen his story, Assistant Professor, Bangladesh Dental College, Bangladesh. Can you hear me? Uh, am I being audible? No. Yes, you are. Just share your uh, Thank PPT. You. Yes. Can you see the PPT? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'm Dr. Shoykot Shah. I work uh, in Bangladesh Dental College. The topic I'm going to present today is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on lifestyle behavior of medical and uh, non-medical students. So to begin with, uh, Lifestyle means someone's way of living, uh, the things that a person or particular group of people usually do. And we all know lifestyle can be uh, affected in a number of ways and uh, pandemic can be one of that. And the unique thing about COVID-19 is uh, it, it possesses a remarkable challenge to people's life and society in, in uh, various ways. So there have been uh, a number of uh, studies conducted in, in other countries that shows that COVID-19 has a significant impact on the lifestyle behavior of population. And uh, students are uh, no exception to that. However, uh, there is limited evidence as to how the pandemic has affected the lifestyle of students. Moreover, it is important to investigate whether COVID-19 has similar effect on lifestyle of students from different background. So the information obtained from this study will help to establish the fundamental basis from which uh, to develop appropriate recommendation for lifestyle modifications during the uh, pandemic. So the objective of our, uh, our study was to assess whether differences exist among medical and non-medical students in terms of COVID-19 related lifestyle behavior. So it was a cross-sectional study. Uh, of course, it was web-based uh, because of uh, ongoing COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And our study population was medical and non-medical students uh, who had the access of internet connections. And study duration was uh, June to July, 2020. And we had a sample size around uh, of 200, 100 from medical and 100 from non-medical background. So uh, a questionnaire was prepared and uh, due to uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as it was not possible to do face-to-face -face interview, so uh, a web-based interview was pl planned and the questionnaire, uh, with the help of the questionnaire, a Google form was created and it was subsequently conveyed uh, to the uh, participant of the study. So uh, the data was uh, uh, further uh, uh, analyzed using spaces and uh, the interpretation of the data was done. So this is the uh, screenshot of our uh, web-based questionnaire, which uh, was uh, uh, designed in, in the Google form. So the results, so the first uh, um, table shows the distribution of the respondents according to their age. And as we can see here, uh, majority of our respondents were from 18 to 
25 years age group with uh, 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 more than uh, two thirds of the students uh, were from 20 to 25 years uh, age group. So uh, the next uh, table shows the uh, sex of the respondents. And as you can see, among the medical students, 85% uh, uh, were female and uh, only 20% were male. And among the non-medical students, uh, almost half were male and just more than half were uh, female. So in table three, uh, we can see the distribution of the respondents by their responses on precautionary measures taken uh, for COVID-19. And here we ask them about uh, wearing of masks, whether they main, maintain adequate physical distance of one meter when they are in crowd, or uh, do they follow the WHO uh, prescribed or guided uh, hand washing technique, which is of 20 seconds time, or uh, do they uh, use their elbow as a safeguard during sneezing, or uh, do they try uh, to avoid uh, long distance traveling uh, during the pandemic time? As you can see, uh, in most of the cases, the responses are, are, are almost all of both medical and non-medical students, 90% of them uh, said uh, yes uh, in, in responses to that question. But interesting thing is, well, while asking them about uh, keeping physical distance of one meter, 88% uh, of medical students said uh, they do that, whereas 83% uh, uh, of uh, non-medical students uh, say that they, uh, they keep uh, distances about one meter when they are in crowd. Now, uh, the uh, uh, next table is uh, the distribution of the respondents by their responses on education uh, during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As uh, this research is on, on uh, students, so we ask them about uh, some questions on, on their educational activity, like uh, whether they fear that there would be a hamper of academic activities due to this uh, pandemic, or uh, they uh, they think that there is a possibility of session jam, or uh, uh, whether they fear of dropping out, and uh, do they feel that there is a lack of interest in them in studying, and also, uh, while doing online classes, uh, have they ever skipped uh, their classes? So as you can see from this table, that uh, more than 90% uh, of both medical and uh, non-medical students, they, they uh, responded that they, uh, they think that there would be a hamper of academic activities. And while uh, asking about session jam, uh, there's a difference between medical and non-medical students that 95% of medical students say that they think there is a possibility of uh, session jam, while uh, non-medical students, uh, about 85% of them. This is probably uh, because that uh, medical and non-medical uh, students, they share a different type of uh, exam methods. And... Uh, the fear of dropping out and or the similar responses were observed from uh, both the group. And interestingly, uh, when uh, they were asked about the skipping of online classes, uh, more than, uh, I mean, uh, exactly two thirds of the students, medical students uh, said that uh, they skipped online classes, whereas on, uh, just more than half of the non-medical students, they said, that uh, they skipped online classes during this uh, pandemic. The next table is, uh, uh, shows uh, the <clears throat> distribution of the respondents by their, resp uh, by their responses on stigma associated with COVID-19. As you know that in the beginning of this COVID-19, there, there are uh, a number of stigma and uh, uh, that people felt associated to. So we were obliged to ask them like, uh, do they feel nervous while seeking medical attention uh, during this pandemic as uh, there were this stigma that it can uh, doctors from doctors or health worker uh, COVID-19 uh, could spread or uh, 
uh, questions like this that uh, the older people are they more likely to be affected by COVID-19? Uh, there's a, a stigma that uh, people would think that uh, if they consume poultry, that can increase the risk of uh, COVID-19 infection. We also ask them about that, whether they think that uh, the mixed herb uh, that can be used as a home remedy for COVID-19. Uh, also, we ask them about that, uh, whether disinfected, uh, there's a stigma about that, that that can, uh, if they, they, that can be injected directly to the blood that can kill COVID-19. And uh, lastly, whether they think that uh, they believe uh, that COVID-19 can make their immune system stronger. So in responses, so uh, uh, like- uh, uh, Mr. Shwekot Shah, uh, may I request you to focus on your major findings because time is like almost seven minutes I, has gone. Mm -hmm. I'll take one, just, just one minute more. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, it's I'm okay. almost uh, uh, almost at the end of my topic. Please. Yeah. Okay. So as you can see uh, from this table, that uh, about the consumption of poultry uh, uh, being uh, uh, increases the risk of COVID-19 infections. That 18 uh, uh, 18 percent medical uh, is uh, students they say uh, yes in responses of that. Whereas almost half of the non-medical students, they, they say that they think that actually poultry, uh, consumption of poultry increases the risk of the uh, COVID-19. And another interesting uh, finding from this table is, is that, that, uh, being, uh, that injecting disinfected directly into the blood, uh, the responses uh, from, again, from non-medical students were like half of them think that, uh, almost half of them think that injecting disinfectants directly into the blood can kill uh, COVID-19. So uh, the, the last table is about that, uh, that how their responses on web and social media use during COVID-19. We asked them about whether uh, they think that the social media, uh, Facebook and other social media help them to uh, stay at home during lockdown or uh, and uh, whether uh, this uh, social uh, media can uh, using social media people uh, uh, could get emergency and medical services. So uh, in response to that, uh, it was like uh, more than 90% uh, of medical students said that uh, uh, yes. But interestingly, when we asked them about that uh, Google, YouTube, and Facebook being the reliable source of information, uh, a uh, medical among medical students, only 72% said it is it is uh, is reliable source of information, but uh, non-medical students think that YouTube being the uh, uh, a reliable source of uh, information. So, in conclusion, uh, the uh, we can conclude that the COVID-19 pandemic poses a substantial impact on lifestyle behavior of both medical and non-medical students. However, Differences of opinion exist between medical and non-medical students on certain aspects of lifestyle behavior. And uh, findings, we hope that findings from this study provide a basis for policymakers to formulate appropriate lifestyle guidance for COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shwekot Shah, for your nice Am presentation. Am I within the limit? No, it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Uh, now I would like to request Adib Jaman, Department of Population Science, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, yes, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, awesome. Is my uh, slide visible? No. Uh, could you try again? Just hold on. Just say share the screen. Yeah, no. now it's okay. Uh, yeah, please proceed. Uh, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to <coughs> convey my sincere gratitude to <coughs> the Public Health Foundation of Bangladesh and the honorable panelists uh, present here today. <coughs> I am Adib Zaman and I am uh, presenting on the factors influencing the utilization of healthcare services, a study on the child labors of Dhaka City. So uh, I will try my best to conclude within eight minutes. Uh, maybe I might need one or two minutes more. 
so going to the background of my study as uh, I think everyone is here uh, is familiar with the term child labor and utilization of healthcare services. Child labor is actually quite common in our society, but it is uh, uh, regarded as exploitative and hazardous by many international organizations uh, because they often face uh, uh, abuse during their work as well as uh, different kinds of uh, toxic exposure from chemical and hazardous working condition. Uh, as a result, uh, they are often falling sick or uh, becoming the subject of uh, different diseases. Uh, so uh, as we all know that uh, those who are more prone to disease and injury uh, are, <clears throat> are expected to utilize the healthcare services at a higher rate. On the other hand, those with a low income and education are expected to utilize the healthcare services at a lower rate. So for the child laborers, it's quite a dilemma uh, because uh, they they are prone to more disease and injury. On the other hand, their income and education level is quite low. Uh, and uh, according to the Bangladesh uh, Child Labor Survey 2013, uh, the informal employment uh, among them is 94.5%, per uh, which actually uh, makes the scenario even worse to analyze. So for, uh, to, <clears throat> for this, uh, the objective of, of this study is to analyze different uh, factors which is affecting their utilization of healthcare services um, and, <clears throat> and this study is actually based on the anderson's model of healthcare utilization uh, which uh, <clears throat> categorizes the independent uh, factors which affect someone's utilization of healthcare services into three different uh, categories the first one is a predisposing factor the second one is enabling factors and the Third and final one is need factors. So for this uh, study, it was a totally quantitative research method and data were collected from child laborers ages five to 17 uh, from six uh, different areas from Dhaka city and the sample size was 200. SPSS 21 was used and three different uh, kinds of analysis was conducted uh, to show the basic characteristics. Uh, the frequency distribution was conducted to uh, uh, show the significant relationship between the variables. The chi-square test was conducted and uh, the variables uh, which showed a significant relationship was uh, <clears throat> included at the final stage for, final stage for uh, regression analysis to analyze the effect on, on, of different factors on their utilization of healthcare services. So <clears throat> moving on to the results, uh, from the first image, uh, you can see that uh, 73% of, of the child laborers uh, reported that they utilized uh, some kind of uh, healthcare services for their <clears throat> sickness or injury, and 26% reported that they didn't or they couldn't. Uh, from the second picture, I think uh, you can see that the highest source of utilization was pharmacy, and the second highest source of utilization was government hospital and uh, private hospital respectively. So the next few <coughs> tables uh, are showing some of the basic characteristics of the respondents included in this study. So uh, <coughs> from the uh, first uh, variable age, you can see that uh, almost uh, all, <coughs> sorry, not <coughs> about 42.5% uh, of the participants belong to the age group of 11 to 14. They were mostly male and uh, almost, uh, 30% of them said that they're currently attending uh, any form of school and 67% reported that they have some uh, form of uh, healthcare knowledge. Then the next uh, <clears throat> table shows the enabling factors. The first one is income. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the respondents report uh, mostly belong to the income group of uh, five to 10,000 taka monthly and uh, you can see the percentage is quite high, which is 51%, uh, which is the largest income group among them. <clears throat> About 58.5% uh, reported that they have some kind of family support when they're sick and 61% uh, reported that uh, <clears throat> they, have some uh, they have some support outside of their family when they're sick. Then the <clears throat> next, next table shows the need factors uh, the first one is the pre presence of disability among them, and uh, only 7% reported that they have uh, some kind of disability. 
24% said that they have the presence of some kind of respiratory or other diseases. And 33% uh, reported that they have, <clears throat> they have some kind of injury. So moving on to the next table, which shows the regression analysis. And uh, from here, uh, you can see that income and education are the two, fact, <clears throat> two variables which showed the most significant relationship uh, <clears throat> with the healthcare utilization. Uh, edu <clears throat> sorry, it was income and education, yes. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the group uh, with the highest income is actually 11 times higher, is actually uh, utilizing the healthcare services 11 times higher than the lowest group. Uh, and the group uh, which uh, reported that they have a completed primary education is uh, utilizing the healthcare services 21 times higher. And this was the <clears throat> most uh, significant relationship among all the variables. And the next one is healthcare knowledge, uh, which is showing that uh, it those who have healthcare knowledge uh, utilizing the healthcare services almost seven times higher. And the those who have family support, uh, for them it is eight times higher, and for those with some kind of support outside family is almost three times higher. So from the analysis, uh, we can say that these five variables, healthcare knowledge, education, income, family support, and support outside family are the most significant factors in terms of them utilizing the healthcare services. So from here, we can recommend that it is, it is a must to ensure safe working environment and easy access for them. And uh, as uh, education was the most significant variable, so uh, it would be great if uh, <clears throat> education is prior prioritized uh, for the child laborers and some form of uh, healthcare knowledge is included in the primary education. And the final, one, <clears throat> final variable, which was a family and other support, uh, as um, some percentage of the child laborers didn't have uh, any kind of family or outside support, it would be great if uh, government uh, can ensure some funding to support them. And with that, I'm concluding my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Adib Jaman, for your nice presentation. Now we have only two presentation. Uh, now I'd like to request uh, Ravi Janum uh, Pali, preventive medicine University of Mississippi Medical Center, USA. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm I'm just getting. I think Adib Jaman, you yeah, please. Yes, sorry, I'm just getting my presentation up. Can you see my presentation? <laughs> no. Okay, let me try one more time. Yeah, I think now it's okay. Yeah, we can start. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. You can see it? Yes, now it's okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, if you see the right side, the below right side, there is an option to make it full screen. Yeah, below right, right side. Yeah, that's okay. Right. Yeah. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Well, um, okay. First of all, uh, one second. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to thank uh, you know the Public Health Foundation of Bangladesh for. Um, allowing me to present in this conference. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so my, my presentation is about the role of epigenetics uh, in COVID-19 susceptibility and treatment in high-risk populations. It's a qualitative review. Um, I'm a preventive medicine resident physician um, in University of Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, I also work with Dr. Fazle Farouk, who's a professor of preventive medicine. So just a little background on the on everything. Um, 
so you know the coronavirus was first discovered in in late December of last year and has led to more than a million and a half deaths. Um, there does seem to be increased mortality and severity in certain populations, especially those people with certain non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease. Also, it's um, seen with more severity in uh, certain minority populations such as African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Um, it's also, you know, seen to be more prevalent in certain countries in the world, like uh, in Europe, in Brazil, in the U.S., in India. Um, okay, let's see. And so one possible explanation for these differences is epigenetic differences in these populations. Epigenetics is a study of heritable phenotype changes that do not involve alterations in the DNA, but rather involve non-DNA changes such as methylation, histone modification, non-coding RNAs, and all of these can influence genetic expression. Um, so the objective of my qualitative review was to examine the pertinent literature in order to answer the following question. How does epigenetics play a role in the pathogenesis of severe disease in susceptible populations? And can it play a role in the treatment of the same populations? So the methods that I used um, were for this qualitative review was that I did an M-based search until October 2020 with the following search terms, epigenetics and COVID-19 or coronavirus or COVID-19. And it was for this last year with full text in English and I excluded letters and notes. So here's just a Prisma diagram. I you know, initially found 52, but I after exclusion and inclusion criteria, I included nine uh, studies in the synthesis. Um, and this is just a summary of that. And key findings include that um, epigenetics may play a role in vitamin therapy, nutritional therapy, differential severity in COVID-19 in different regions of the world, and also in the susceptibility of certain populations, such as certain minorities and people from certain countries. Um, so, just an overview of one of the results of my study. Um, vitamin nutritional therapy vitamins, especially vitamin C, D, B complex may be epigenetic modifiers that may play a helpful role, especially in people with uh, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, cancer, renal disease. These non-communicable disease may have inherent deficiency states of these vitamins that may predispose them to severe COVID-19 disease. Vitamin D um, has been shown to um, epigenetically modify genes for inflammatory cytokines, um, thus preventing the cytokine storm. African Americans who have higher levels of vitamin D deficiency than any other ethnicity may benefit from combination of vitamin D and L-cysteine, which is you know, a precursor to glutathione, and this is an antioxidant. Um, so an epigenetics and early life adversity. Uh, so age adjusted COVID-19 mortality is 2.8 times higher in Hispanic, Native American and African American populations versus Caucasian populations. Uh, much of this mortality is in inner cities and low socioeconomic areas. This may be a result of early life epigenetic modification leading to reduced immune function with senescent CD8 T cells. And you know, we see this also in a lot of developing countries such as India and Bangladesh, you know, where you have early life exposure to a lot of pollution, crowding, and poverty. So this could also apply. Um, and right here, so epigenetics and the worldwide pandemic. The case rate and mortality has been more pronounced in several countries and regions, including Europe and the Americas, and less pronounced in Africa, Asia, and Oceania, with some exceptions, India, for example. There may be differential um, MIR RNA, which is non-coding RNA binding profiles on SARS-CoV-2 genomes from countries with more cases and deaths. For example, European miRNA have characteristic clusters not seen in other in those from other regions. This study is actually from Bangladesh, and I'll go over it a little bit later. Um, so here is like the main results from my study. I'll just do a brief description of them. So you can see here, you know, vitamins are epigenetic modifiers. 
um, through you know methylation, deacetylation. Um, so as you can see here, um, vitamin D, C, and B can you know help reduce these inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, CRP, IL-10, TNF alpha, which are, have been shown to be uh, involved in the cytokine storm that leads to uh, a lot of the ARDS and mortality. Um, so you can see here for different populations, you might wanna do generally A, C, and D are good vitamins to supplement, maybe also B vitamins in these high-risk populations. Um, and you can see here, this study is actually from Bangladesh, differential uh, MRI, mRNA binding profiles on SARS-CoV genomes from countries with different mortality. Um, so, you know, certain countries have had worse uh, prevalence and mortality. Um, and it's possible that these countries have differential uh, epigenetic changes, possibly in non-coding mRNAs that, you know, somehow influence the way that um, people are affected um, by these different strains. Um, so further research is needed in these, you know, high prevalence areas like India, like Brazil, US. Um, also, it's important to see here that even, you know, certain foods like, you know, a whole food diet can also maybe help with preventing COVID-19. So here, it, you know, um, beta glucan, which is found in whole wheat and grains can possibly help uh, with, uh, um, with, you know, leading to trained immunity, which can help against viruses. Um, and then we'll go on here. And then here, see, there was one study that I included in my review, environmental stresses can lead to epigenetic modifications that lead to long-term negative health outcomes. Um, so, you know, low SES population with increased exposure to pollution, ionizing radiation, smoking, alcohol, and higher propensity to non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, CVD can possibly lead to senescence of T cells and um, lead to a higher risk of mortality and morbidity with COVID-19. This could definitely apply to urban populations um, in developing countries where you have extreme levels of population uh, and pollution. Um, also, one of the other studies I looked at was, you know, in uh, immunocompromised patients, lupus patients, uh, they might have uh, hypomethylation and overexpression of ACE2, which, you know, um, may make them more prone to oxidative damage. And thus, you know, it's, um, and then also here, um, here we have, um, uh, Mr. Roby, just, yeah, I think you should. Yes, okay, okay, okay. sure, sure. Uh, so, you know, epigenetics, um, sorry, okay. So, you know, also um, low vitamin D levels have been shown to be uh, associated with increased mortality and severity with COVID-19. There are a lot of studies in various places that have shown this, um, though the research is still ongoing. So vitamin D, you know, might epigenetically modify transcriptional outfit output that um, helps repress inflammatory cytokines. So it might be really good to, you know, in high risk populations to supplement, to measure and supplement vitamin D levels to 40 to 60 and, um, NG per ml. Um, you know, so deficiency is usually anything below uh, 20, severe deficiency is anything below 15. Um, and um, so just basically, um, you know, epigenetics might be really important in explaining why, you know, the coronavirus has had devastatingly different effects in different populations throughout the world. I mean, you know, there is really no explanation for why mortality and prevalence is so high in Brazil, so high in India, but not as high, you know, in South Korea, in Japan, in Asia. Why is it? Is it, is it non-coding mRNAs? Is it epigenetic changes? Is it uh, early life risk factors? Is it vitamin deficiencies? You know, so um, further population-based studies need to be done in order to answer these questions. And in the meantime, you know, we can consider um, 
doing vitamin and nutritional supplementation um, in, in certain populations. And I just wanted to thank you for letting me participate in your conference. Okay, so thank you, Ravi, for your comprehensive presentation. Now we would like to go our last but not least presenter, Tapan Kumar Nath, uh, former Deputy Secretary, Government of Bangladesh, and Project Officer and National Coordinator, WHO Health City Program, Dhaka. Mr. Tapan Kumar Nath, are you ready? Yes, uh, thank you. As I don't have too much slide to show you, Okay. But uh, uh, abstract. Yeah. Uh, of the do you share any yeah. any any documents or you will just share it? Yeah, I send one, one. One. Okay. One let me share. Let me share. The title. Yeah. Is it okay? So. Uh, yeah, it is okay. Uh, the, yes. yes, this one is fine. Yeah. So actually, I plan to say about the healthy cities program or healthy settings. This could be village or this could be a hospital and relating urban planning practice with this WHO healthy city program. I work with WHO five years uh, with Leon from the government. So uh, it is a story that how we have started in Bangladesh and what a result we have got but uh, when I left WHO 15 years back, then it is actually slowed down. Now again, it is uh, WHO taking initiative. Why healthy city? Healthy city is actually needed because of the need of citizen, as head of the WHO was talking a few minutes back in a YouTube, that city authority cannot cope with the need of the growing population. We know that half of the population will be living in the cities within five to 10 years. And this is increasing and increasing. So the city authority, I mean that the municipality authority, the mayor um, is responsible to actually meet the need with the coordination of the other organization like WASHA, electricity board or waste management system in the municipality unit. How they do it? Actually, we, as the case of Dhaka, we see that there is a lot of traffic jam, and we see that there is, um, you know, not livable condition in the cities. For the reason, actually, what uh, WHO started from Ottawa Charter that healthy public policy is needed. The healthy public policy, actually, the public health system, where uh, how the government willing to address the challenges of basic needs of the citizen, including water, electricity, other infrastructure, even housing, healthy housing. They live in the slum, or some people living in a big bungalow or building in utility, it is also addressed. And it is actually a supportive environment is created in the city. Uh, if we take the example of Chiragong Healthy City, we have started first in Southeast Asia. Um, as a doctor, Mr. Fori, he was posted the Secretary of um, Minister of Health, Minister of Health and Family Welfare. Then in 1993, in a seminar of seminar of CRO, I mean the Southeast Asian region in Delhi, he, he proposed the name of Chittagong City. So we are proud of uh, Chittagong and a kind of clean and a really healthy, uh, about to be a healthy city. We should not say that it is 100% healthy city, but it is a journey to start. Then we replicated it to the Cox's Badger, uh, another big city. And this was also in the literature of healthy city in Europe and other 
university uh, and they have some public led by the popular i mean uh, who is charismatic leader mr mahiddin choudhury he has keen interest and working with other organization forming a coordination council with other developing agencies like washa and mental department health service department whoever contributing in the series with the projects important monthly coordination meeting is one of the way then they form the tax forces tax forces for water supply tax forces for waste management tax forces for primary health care like that so this is not so complex actually but when the citizen and other people sit together discuss together collaborate for coordination then new idea new solution come out and the resources actually mobilized locally uh, we said uh, local resources should be mobilized if it is not enough then health city planning asks for funding from developing partners like world bank undp or other but if you don't have a plan a multi sectoral investment plan we say then you actually cannot ask for the money if you go for bank loan for your house construction then in the bank manager asks for a plan what plan you want to do likely if a city authority asks for the money then they need a health city plan with the plan then we can proceed uh, step by step fixing the priority is the water is the priority or is it the uh, air pollution is the priority now we can see in the television in different media the air pollution is the big priority in indian channel we notice that the you know asking the people we can appeal that please uh, stop your car for one day not to drive because the air pollution very recently in delhi and dhaka and other cities actually keeping an impact of lower iq of our children and it is uh, in bangkok uh, we saw in when we were study there so air pollution water pollution garbage management transport um, problem these are addressed so th this is a kind of a story uh, my working experience i share and actually i don't want to take too much time i will be willing to answer your question i mean one healthy settings also healthy settings means bilays i hope that many of audience or participant here will be encouraged to see their village as a healthy model village complete sanitation and there is a literacy uh, toward 100% literacy and toward you know the not child abuse or child marriage kind of thing if i go to my village i can actually motivate the people with the committee with the volunteering mostly the government agencies and the non government agencies collaborate collaboration is important and we move then toward uh, the capacity of the community that can flourish with the full human potential that everybody can get the skill of employment and everybody can live in a uh, healthy environment and the changes in the health delivery system now we see that if it is not actually able to cope with the need of the people the covid situation is see that crisis of covid bed or we can say icu or we can say that um, ventilation kind of things and uh, these are a little mismanaged uh, if dhaka could be one of the healthy cities how dhaka proceed to the healthy cities it is simply to write a letter by the mayor to the who i am willing to start healthy cities model then who send national consultant advisor or the unit coordinator to discuss what do you have what do you don't have at least 
and what actually you are asking for this kind of discussion dialogue actually helps to move toward a better situation i hope that uh, our mayor honorable mayors of the different rashi is a healthy city clean city i put my efforts five years in chirong kokshi bazar but with the gap kokshi bazar became very unhealthy now and it is actually uh, not yet properly planned for the reason we appeal to the mayors or the political leaders it is actually political commitment that mayor the fathers of the city they should say that i am committed to build healthy city for the citizen who has voted me sir so, we are running out of time may i request you okay so your, yeah. within half a minute i am actually concluding thank you uh it is a case study a kind of actually i didn't make slight too much it was uh, in a journal so from there actually i am sharing to you and i ask you to ask any question in chat box or in my email and if you are interested about your own a small town or shoba what is say or your village you can search the healthy village healthy setting healthy city model which was actually generate from ottawa charter and primary health care kind of it encourages the sanitation it encourages the wash hand we said that healthy home who said that healthy person if you are not healthy these things are now discussed all over the world so who now again uh, studying healthy city program i saw they are recruiting people last month i hope to actually work with them again so hope for the best thank you all the distinguished panelists and the uh, honorable chairman and moderator uh, giving me the opportunity public health foundation of bangladesh thank you very much thank you mr tapan kumar for sharing your experience uh, so before going to hand over the session to our session chairs we got one questions uh, from our one participant shoaib tarobdar uh, he asked to our presenter joyita datto that how can we measure the term depression uh that are defined by medical term or you focus on your study people perspective about this issue and if you use medical term to your research is it possible to cover their actual situation regarding your research topic uh, could you please repeat the question sure so the question is how can you measure the term depression mm -hmm. that are defined by medical term or you focus on your study people perspective about this issue okay no mm -hmm. actually i uh, if you look at uh, look into the presentation uh, properly i did not measure the term depression i actually what i did is i measured the magnitude of uh, prevalent uh, magnitude of depression uh, to to say the magnitude of depression i meant the prevalence of depression which can be measured depression you cannot measure depression uh, i use the ordinal scale like uh, P, if we using the phq9 tool what i did if 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 the, the that in that tool if you score somewhat between 0 to 4 you have mild depression if you score 5 to 9 you have moderate depression if you score 10 to 14 you have uh, moderate moderately severe depression and uh, uh, sorry uh, 14 to 19 moderately severe depression and uh, if you score greater than 20 it is severe depression that is the level of depression we can measure that just like we have the scales in uh, we we say that ordinal scale like when we measure some uh um, variable we we can say that just for example you, you cannot measure pain right when you are asking in a questionnaire survey how do you feel the pain that is a qualitative question but how do in quantitative study how do we measure the pain we say how how will you score your pain in a scale of 1 0 to 9 0 being the lowest 9 being the highest then the respondent 
uh, response to that question and we measure the level of pain based on that kind of question. So it is somewhat, uh, the PHQ-9 tool measures the depression somewhat like that. It does not measure depression, but mm -hmm. it, it measures the level of depression by asking a set of questions. There are nine questions in the tool. If you look at the tool, uh, you can, I, as we had very limited time, mm. I did not okay. put the yeah. tool in my presentation. So yeah, we di I did not measure depression. It is the level of depression and I measured okay. the prevalence of depression. Thank you, Joita. I think I still You're am now. So mm -hmm. now I would like to request our honorable session chair, Professor uh, Mahabuba Nasrin, Director, Institute of Disaster Management and Vulnerability Studies, University of Dhaka. May I request to say something, uh, Professor Mahabuba Nasrin? If you unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me, madam? Uh, okay. Okay, I think we can wait. Uh, by this time, we can go our another honorable uh, session of chair, Professor M.H. Farooq, Associate Professor Department of Occupational Health and Environmental Health, uh, Bangladesh University of Health Science. May I request, sir, to say something uh, regarding the presentations? Thank you. Thank you, Monam al Islam Sijar, and thank you all the uh, participants, as well as our chair, co chairperson. And I am seeing my, one of my professor, Professor Monsur, and everybody. Thank you. Actually, I am very much impressed with the presentations. So far, I remember one of my teacher, once he told me that he's a good researcher whose work can initiate others to conduct the next researches. And so far, I understand the, all of the, the, these researchers, though they are very young, but they made some good researches. So this can be initiate the others, influence the others to do the next researches on their, on their specific issues. However, I have to go everyone one by one. First of all, I would like to discuss about the Mr. Abu Said. It's a good issue about the wastage of the water. We know that water is abundance, but safe water is very costly and also limited resource. So it's a very good initiative as well as very good, one good document also to say our other peoples that we should use the water less, we should save the water more, and we should advocate these things to others always. And the Joita Dotto, yes, her research is another good research. And of course, the depressive illness is one of the most prevalent health problem all over the world. And also, this has the impact on the, not only the well-being living, also the life expectancy, as well as the productivity also. So there are so other predisposing factors which can develop the uh, depressive illness. So it is very important now to work, to find out the root causes as well as the remedies, how we can uh, cope the problem with the depressive illness. And Dr. Shoykot Shah, this is a, another good documentation regarding the pandemic changes on COVID-19. This COVID-19 actually changes our life, not only our behavior. It is very good that another issue I found from his research that the, our students are very much concerned about their schooling loss, especially, especially in this COVID-19 situation. And another good research, Adib Jaman, he also found a good research regarding the uh, utilization of the healthcare services by the child labor. Actually, it is a true thing that our child labor 
they are not only poor but also and having the less literacy that's why they have to go out very quickly to attend the pharmacy to have their uh, treatment or the, uh, or other illness and it would be very nice if mr adib uh, dr adib jaman can go another points regarding the health problems with the which health problems these child laborers are visiting the pharmacy or the government hospitals or the other doctors or other healthcare healers and nam and mr ravi jaman pali he said good research also research in the epigenetics this is a very interesting issue i think it may provide some more opportunity especially which can help us in research allocation in the healthcare services all over the world especially in bangladesh also we are also expecting to utilize this epigenetic i don't know whether it is possible in our country and i hope they can provide extend their hands to provide this um, issues to utilize in bangladesh also and lastly i am very thanks to mr tapon kumar nath for sharing his experience regarding the health healthy city initiative actually it's a integrated program and very recently we found that our a uh, city mayor dhaka city mayors they got the authority to utilize the water supply and sanitary and supply issue from the wasa to clean the dhaka city and to to resolve the water uh, maroon problem during the uh, rainy season so thank you everybody i think it's a good experience for me to attend this program and to hear some interesting issues and resources and many thanks to public health foundation to and continue their researches and their activities even under the pandemic situation with covid-19 and thank you everybody uh thank you uh, professor mh faruqi sir for his excellent speech now i would like to request our honorable session chair professor mahabuba nasrin director institute of disaster management and vulnerability studies university of dhaka good night i think this is the time uh -huh. already uh, for saying good night thank you very much i would like to uh, congratulate public health foundation days uh, for all the people who are involved here your eighth public health foundation day and virtual international conference we have been listening to the uh, to uh, through the moderator mohammad munayamul islam sizar and also professor mh faruqi just uh, he has delivered his speech i would like to congratulate all the presenters who have presented their uh, paper nicely in fact it's diversified our former uh, one of the presentations uh, they say that uh, that it's a diversified uh, field and i think that some of these are very much related to social sciences and also other issues so if i uh, just i don't want to take the uh, time uh, more time from you and i would like to say that one by one the papers and you all know that covid 19 pandemic Uh, is uh, giving us uh, new lessons and we call it it's a paradigm shift so the first paper um, uh, mr abu said and from the post uh, like department of post harvest technology and marketing potuakali science and um, university of science and technology water loss during the hard washing uh, so what he has mentioned that he rightly pointed out the snowball method like i should say that the participants so i am just going to the academic side of all the papers so the com comparison that he has done that uh, to me it's most important that 
Handwash practicing uh, increased, we all know, but side by side, he mentioned about the water loss, like the amount, huge amount, he, we, we have to have these kind of like um, policy related to that 13% increase that is alarming. And in the water crisis situation, we know uh, many people won't be able to use water, but some people are wasting. That's also happened during that any kind of crisis situation. So that is uh, the, that we have to look at uh, in these matters. And I think you are uh, pointing out properly. And the next paper, uh, I would like to say that uh, depressive morbidity among female ready-made garments by uh, garment workers uh, of Bangladesh, like Joita Dotto, she mentioned it's as a story. And uh, I think the prevalent depression, and she rightly pointed out it will be increased and it not will be, we have already identified because many of them already lost their job be through, because of the cancellation of order and others. So uh, that, that would be giving a, a mental health pressure uh, to all of these. As you know that uh, like pandemic is increasing and demand for mental health services, like these are also uh, increasing. So we have seen that uh, there are less expenses on the uh, mental health issues earlier, but now uh, we have to look at not only the ready-made garment sectors, specifically this sector important, and also the people, people who are coming to Bangladesh after losing job or uh, just uh, they enter to Bangladesh uh, expatriate. So these are the two um, vital sectors who are suffering. So that mental health issues also we have to look up after, uh, like it's, it could be like w, w, like World Health Organization's perspective also there. So the third paper, I should say that impact of pandemic on lifestyle behavior uh, by, uh, I think it's presented by Shaukat Shah as uh, Shaukat Shah. Uh, this, should I, uh, I don't know whether the pronunciation I'm rightly doing it. So uh, he's an assistant professor. So the lifestyle behavior, we have also seen that how comparison between medical and non-medical students. And uh, if we identify people like this as medical and non-medical, it should be that knowledge, attitude, practices, uh, cap exercises. In your methodology, if, if, if you have endorsed the cap exercise, knowledge, attitude, and practices, that would be comparable because the medical students are having some practices, some lessons already in the curriculum, but there are some social behavior. Uh, it's like smoking uh, a cigar like smoking, all doctors know that it's not good, but some, some doctors are practicing like that. So if we compare, we have to have specifically in these areas, 100% male-female ratio and others. Like you have selected medical students, male 20 and female 80. At the same time, you have selected non-medical students, 47% uh, male and female uh, 53. So I don't know that whether uh, this, uh, these were purposive. I think it's the purposive, but what are the purposes if you mention? So equal kind of uh, representation from both male and female will give you this cap exercises more strong. I think in future paper, you can say. And all of you, I think in the summary, when you uh, give analysis in tables, sometimes it's not reader friendly or also chair friendly. So if we look at the summary analysis in brief, before the conclusion, uh, after the table presentation, it will also save your time and you just show the numbers. And the fourth paper uh, was of um, Adib uh, Jaman, I think, yes, Adib Jaman, Department of uh, Population Sciences. And he mentioned about the uh, factors which are affecting these people uh, who are uh, who are in the mental health service, not only mental mental health, but you have also gave some of the public health issues, which were like uh, I should say that uh, factors those who are influencing uh, 
uh, those uh, impact of COVID-19 uh, you have given. So the factors who are influencing, there are many, many factors, but uh, you mentioned some of these and uh, safe working environment is, uh, uh, is, is very good uh, findings from your side and education, like educating through curriculum, uh, education knowledge from community. I think community education is much more important at this time, health related behavior and other uh, behavior also. And the final paper uh, was from uh, the, like, you know, the, the, the fifth paper was from role of epigenetics in COVID-19 susceptibility and treatment in high risk population. So who are the high risk population that mentioned properly? And I think uh, this is much more public health related. Uh, some of those issues not understandable to me like a non-medical students, but I think it will be very beneficial for you. The last paper was on who healthy city program and urban planning. It's very relevant. I think uh, Tapun Kumar Nath, who has served in the government and uh, he mentioned um, properly that how could we uh, tackle the urban population? Because uh, specifically, if we look at uh, that uh, issues related to the, uh, to some of the policy he mentioned about the, uh, like policy of World Health Organization. So that World Health Organization, like what should we say, who should we do in context of the, uh, these uh, kind of urban areas and that we have to look after. So specifically for public health approach, I would like to say that uh, we have to protect, we have to care, we have to recover and we have to support. So how we are going to do this, these are the important issues. So social economic normalcy is related to, are related to health issues. So how increasing capacity of this, uh, like these, not only this professional, but different health services important. So we need to have a demand, uh, we need to have a planning, better planning, preparedness, response and mitigation activities for risk. And finally, risk transfer mechanisms, because we cannot blame health sectors for not doing many things, but we have to have the risk transfer mechanism, like how to involve others in the public health sectors. And there are so many more issues. So thank you very much. I have taken, I think, more than allocated yeah, no, time. No, it's okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Professor Pahwa Nasim, Madam, for uh, your constructive and concise uh, speech. It was really nice. So I think now it's time to say goodbye and good night because though in the Netherlands now it's like afternoon, but I know in Bangladesh it's like 10 past something. So uh, we are really lucky that we are going to finish our this session without any kind of technological interruption. That's really good. And again, I would like to thank you to our all the participants, our panelists, our attendees uh, to join and make this program uh, meaningful. And uh, now I can see Professor Monsur Ahmed sir uh, thank you, sir, for joining and hearing our, uh, us for the last three hours. Uh, yeah. So stay safe and yeah. good night, all. Thank you very much. Uh, can can, so, can I say something? One, one yes, sir, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to <laughs> actually um, uh, enjoy this uh, nice session. I'm sorry that I was not present during the beginning of this session. Uh, in fact, I had some COVID present in my house. My wife is affected, my son is affected. So my wife's report has come. So uh, her lung was not uh, uh, affected. So that's a good thing. And uh, so anyway, and I enjoyed uh, the, um, this, the, the presentation of the uh, about five, about five, uh, uh, Six four or five uh, mm -hmm. presenters. And uh, those are really nice, the young scientists. They presented very um, informative uh, uh, um, data, which will be utilized for our future uh, researches. And um, I'm very happy to see Professor Mahbuba Nassim. Uh, <laughs> I met her last time we had our uh, uh, 
conference on environment uh, last year uh, i think assalamu alaikum apa apni asha kori bhalo hi achen so um, I mean, I, I, I thank uh, Caesar for your uh, nice uh, uh, conduction of the uh, session. So, when Kumar Nath, I wish you Dhanu Janathi. Abong, so when Babu, I mean, if you don't mind, apni actually, apna presentation ra khobi topic ta khobi halo. So, I mean, asha kuch chilam jiki su data ho ta apna kaise thakbe, but uh, anyway. Uh, thank you very much and I, I, I am just an observer actually. Uh, you, are, uh, you have run this session very nicely mm -hmm. and uh, my thank congratulations you. from the Public Health Foundation of Bangladesh. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you all. And just one, uh, one uh, thing that we have tomorrow another session. So if your time permits, you may join. Thank you very much. Thank you again to ECMI and Raj TV. Good night. Thank you, Mark. You are watching Raj TV. Jagorone, Bangladesh. Please subscribe our channel.